been a while since we've talked about Williams. We detailed their problems at the start of the year and to be honest, I think we've almost tried to leave them to it because it's obvious every single weekend how much trouble the team is in at the moment, how much ground they have to make up. But is there finally some light at the end of the tunnel? We're going to try and get those answers from Scott Mitchell and Ed Straw. Scott, you've been tracking Williams very closely for Autosport.com and Motorsport.com, trying to provide updates whenever possible on the team's future, in fairness, on and off the track. Let's look at on the track and the car performance. Are there finally some positive noises coming out of the team? Yeah, they're the easiest team on the grid to track. Cause they're, they're moving slowest, so uh, that, that makes it a bit easier. I think there is. I had a chat with, um, a, a, as well as a lot of positive noise that's coming out in media sessions and stuff on the record, I, I had an off-the-record off chat with, uh, with let's say, a, a, a prominent part of the, <laughs> the Williams setup at the moment. Uh, who said they didn't necessarily believe there was light at the end of the tunnel in pre-season when they missed the start of testing and they were really slow when they started testing. Then the car turned out to be illegal and then Paddy Lowe went on a leave of absence and all of this mess was happening. There was all this talk about, oh, we're, it, there's going to be progress light at the end of the tunnel. They didn't really believe that. But now they do. There's a big uh, upgrade package coming over the next sort of few few weeks but well, we won't maybe we won't see it for the next couple of races but certainly by the summer break there will there's a the, the first sort of signs of proper performance coming to this car they've had a, a development backlog that they've had to work through this was a legacy of, of the um, needing to change a few things about the the car design to ensure it was legal plus the fact that they were late starting the season so everyone was behind schedule already then they had to reshift sort of the working program to make the car legal before they could make it quicker then a drain attacked George Russell in Baku and Robert Kubica got a bit too friendly with the wall so they had to manufacture a bunch <laughs> of new parts there and it's one thing after another but even within that they've they've had a few high high points uh, in Spain they had their smallest deficit of the season to both getting through Q1 and to the the front of the grid in in, in the first part of qualifying so that was a performance step, despite not having a major upgrade package there and their rivals all having quite significant upgrades. Yeah, Monaco was a bit more sort of back down to earth with a, with a bit of a bump because it, it exposed the weaknesses of the package. But yeah, there, there has been progress, even though it's hard to see when you're three seconds off the pace. Progress is there and they're quite optimistic that in the sort of coming months there'll be a little bit more to show for it as well. Ed, would you agree with that? You obviously watch the cars very closely from trackside and you're pouring over the data when you're analysing the Grand Prix weekend. Have these sort of shoots of progress that Scott's mentioning there been, been obvious from what you've been looking at? You can certainly see an improvement. I remember watching trackside uh, in Australia and the, the car looked very, very much uh, a handful and it has, it has got better in, in that regard. There have been times where so it's a bit iffy. There, were, there was one floor that was suspected, that was the same spec as the others, but suspected to have a bit of a problem. But then it had an interaction with a drain in, in Baku, which uh, removed that one from, uh, from consideration. So I think they've kind of understood what they've got. They've got on top of the car. It didn't look brilliant on Thursday in Monaco, but then they improved it. And actually George Russell turned in a, a very strong qualifying performance. He's very proud of touching the wall at the back on the entry. Um, he's very proud of that. On the man. outside? On the, not, yeah, not on the outside of the entry, yeah. I was just thinking yeah. that, yeah. yeah that's on, on the ultimate clipping of the apex. Yeah, as, as I said to him, that's unorthodox. <laughs> 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 place you normally uh, ex expect to do it. And actually, Robert Kubica, I think, had a pretty decent weekend in Monaco, probably one of, it, one of his best so far. This year, ultimately, the car doesn't have the downforce, and that's going to take time. You can't just magically put downforce on the car. But it's interesting, you, Scott mentioned how strong they were in Spain. That was when they were closest to the rest of the midfield. And what Spain offers is lots of long load to get the tyres warmed up. And you bet, to warm up tyres, basically you, you squash them and you move them side to side in the most basic terms. If you, if you go to a circuit like Monaco where there's lots of corners but they're not really getting the same long load as they were in Spain, then it is harder. And Montreal could be difficult as well. I think they've understood the car. They're getting something out of it. We haven't seen any dramatic performance steps, certainly. But at least they've got a sense of equilibrium. And the fact that they've got upgrade packages coming that they think will put some performance on the car, the back of the midfield is not so far out of sight that they can't hope to at least just edge up to the back of it and have something to race for. They had a little bit of a chance to do that in Monaco because of the way the race worked out and the advantage of track position if you, if you can get it. So it's still going to be a long, hard season. 
for Williams. They're going to be at or near the back throughout, but at least it probably doesn't feel like a total waste of time turning up, which it probably did early in the year. Well, the, the, the two things that sort of spring to mind for me, one is Russell's qualifying lap in Spain, which was, was for a Williams, very good. It was a few, only a few temps away from the, the next lowest team, and they've not been that close at all all season, which was good. And then Russell's race in Monaco, where he briefly for a moment thought he was in contention for points. I think, it, I think he said uh, he thought he was in fighting for sixth at one stage because of the way the, the, safety, the early safety car split a bunch of strategies. But the key for that was that he was hanging on to that midfield group for a bit, wasn't he? And he obviously got, got gradually detached from it. He's kind of in the midfield group because Lando Norris was providing a handy roadblock yeah. to assist science. So it, the, the race had been artificially slowed down, yeah. but even so. But I, I don't think they would have been... Especially somewhere like Monaco, it just that, that's not even been a strong Williams place, has it? Even before the car was rubbish, so uh, I can imagine they went to there thinking we're just going to be miles away. So there's yeah, there's been these little few crumbs of comfort. So if they, I think if they can, I think the, the key thing will be not to be disheartened if they're marooned at the back of the grid, even more so in in Canada than say Barcelona. They have that sort of long term optimism and. The, the hope that you'll see those cars slightly further forward, maybe sort of middle, second part of the season. Ed, you mentioned there that probably we are going to see Williams at the back through the year. Obviously, they've, they've got a lot of ground to make up, so even some quite big steps could still leave them at the back. That often prompts talk, not always inside, but sometimes outside of the paddock, of this, this magical flipping the switch and just focusing on 2020 instead. You know, write this car off and just get next year's right. Has there been any indication from Williams that that would even be something they'd consider? Well, Claire Williams, the deputy team principal, said absolutely not. And her rationale was that, well, we're Williams and we keep racing. And that's fine. That's all good tub-thumping stuff. But actually, the reality is that they can't really. It doesn't really work like that. The quintessential example is obviously Honda writing off 2008 to focus on 2009. But that was a huge rule change. 2019 to 2020 isn't a rule change. It's effectively a two-year car project really that they'll they'll evolve based on the same sport so what they need to do is understand their weaknesses with this car and correct them if there's something fundamental in the concept of the car there's not many things you can't change there are you know we can assume that the monocoque should be fine that's that's not really thing teams get wrong nowadays so everything they've got there is basically a laboratory to to test for next year with and any gain they get with this year's car should translate to to next year's car. I think the really key thing, when this big upgrade does come, they need it to deliver the performance because that will validate the path that they're on and the corrective measures they've taken to try and fix the things that led to them having a car that push comes to shove is just down on downforce. If this was 2020 and we were talking about 2021, different equation, new regs, dramatically new regs. But right now, Williams needs to keep doing what it's doing keep understanding, keep improving, because any gain they find this year, almost any gain at least, should translate into a gain next year to build on. The 2021 rules is, for me, the reason why they can't give up on the 2019 car, because if they don't correct the mistakes of this year's car, and they've got these problems again in 12 months' time, they're going to be absolutely lost going into 2021, which is their big opportunity to get back in the big time. And For Williams, whether you define the big time as fighting for wins and podiums or simply being in the mix to score a few points, they've got to make a big leap. And they're not realistically going to do that over the course of 2019 or even into 2020, but they've got to view, as Ed put it, that 2019-2020 season is effectively one season spread over 24 months. And then give themselves a proper platform, validate, as Ed said, the platform that they've got, because that will ultimately be what they base the 2021 car on. And Williams have got to get that right. They're, they're not going to have an opportunity to make a, such a big step season to season as they will 20 to 21. And given how badly things have gone, the sort of down, downward slope they've been on the last couple of three years, that, that's an opportunity that they can't afford to miss. If you said to Williams, you can be respectable by the end of the year and solid next year, and then that'll leave you clear to go for 2021 and have the chance to jump to the front that's not going to happen or jump up to a good level that they, they take that that that's what this is about Williams has to get back to a to a decent a decent credible midfield level that that's that's the level for Williams it's not it's not the 1990s anymore we can't sit here and say Williams should be winning races that that would be a nonsense and unfair on them because of the the financial footing overall they're on but they need at least to be solid and respectable and this year's a test bed for achieving that